It's recording. You got it? We're we going. Talking? It's going. Good. Ah, so we had to hit record sometime. And uh So here we are. Hello, Mr. Maxwell. Hello, Mr. Maxwell. So here it is. We're uh here looking at episode one. The introduction. The introduction episode. The golden triangle signal. The signal. Well, this was this was originally your idea, Stephen, and you came up with this. I guess it was last spring. I guess it would have been the spring of 2019 is when this sparked off in your mind. So tell us a little bit. What so what kicked this off for you? What were you thinking? Well, so here we are, February 5th of 2020, and uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, last last spring, spring of 2019, uh, this idea started rolling around in my head, and um, you know just as uh, as well as anybody how many ideas roll through my mind and uh whether or not I nonstop nonstop and whether or not I act on those is a different story but this was kind of one of those ideas that wouldn't let go and uh it's uh well you took some time you know you we took some time you told me a little bit about it and we kind of rolled some things around we kind of put together kind of a checklist of some research to do and started mm-hmm. formulating a game plan yeah Got on the phone with some uh, with somebody in uh, Washington D.C. and got their opinion on equipment and processes and procedures and what we need to look at as far as priorities. So it's been a long time. It's been almost a year that we've been kicking this around, but I think we got a good plan. We got a good purpose. We got some good equipment. We tested the equipment, so we should have a good path forward to to move forward productively and deliver a pretty good product. Absolutely. Um, so kind of the inspiration behind this was kind of twofold. One was the um, the fact that there are a, an incredible number of, in, of very, very interesting people in the southeast Texas region, uh, Beaumont, Lumberton, Port Arthur, Houston, uh, up into Woodville, uh, Tyler, uh, even uh, West Louisiana. There's uh, a lot of very, very interested, interesting, and talented folks all around. And I felt like, and I still feel like, a lot of these people don't have their stories out there. They Their stories aren't published. They're not recorded. And they deserve to have their story told somehow at the very least they just they uh deserve to have their story recorded for uh future uh generations and hopefully we can use this as an avenue to kind of get to those people hear those interesting stories um uh hopefully uh people that will have on the on this podcast uh in the in the very near future or world war 2 veterans combat veterans from world war 2 and vietnam um, there are local businessmen who have quite literally built their businesses from the from the ground up. Uh, first generation uh, businessmen who have been incredibly successful. Um, local athletes that that nobody knows about. Um, highly successful people, both professionally um, in sports, whatever it might be. Super interesting people all over the place, and we want to kind of capture those stories. There's another uh, avenue to this. The second avenue is a uh, lack of mentorship or a lack of information in our industrial environment, our industrial area. And you and I both come from a from a industrial construction background, and we're going to expound on that a little bit in this episode. But there are uh there's a there's a, a great need in our local economy for craftsmen for uh professionals uh engineers even uh people in the medical field uh people in sales um we need people to fill those roles we need fi- people to fill those positions and you know in any part of the industry we're we're seeing um a greater and greater difficulty from the companies of filling these positions. Yes, and you d- you don't just need the positions filled. 
You also need competent people that are professional. Even though it's a trade position, you need to, to be dependable. You need to be professional. You need to have these core traits. And a lot of times we're seeing these younger guys coming up in these in these apprenticeship or these helper roles, working their way up through the, uh, through the ranks of the trades, are, are not seeing the importance of this, not getting the right mentorship to realize that, hey, you know, you need to develop these skills. You need a talent stack. As some people talk very highly about talent stack, you need to stack up these skills so that you can you continue to move forward, that you can be more successful, and that you can move up in the ranks and realize your potential. Yes, mentorship. We're constantly getting back to that mentorship. And then we want to, so we want to kind of bring people on to the podcast that we can talk about their particular role in the industry, whatever it might be, and how they are trying to recruit people uh, for their uh, niche. Also trying to provide a lot of mentorship to the younger generation coming up if they're trying to get into these roles, what steps they should be taking to get into that part of the industry. And what steps they should be taking once they're in the industry to advance themselves, move forward. Uh, you and I have both had uh, some success in the industry, and, and we can expound on that in the future. And we want to kind of talk about the things that separated us from some of our peers at different times in our uh, in our careers, and also, you know, times that we hit low points in our careers, and what contributed to those. You know, what were the some of the some of the choices we made throughout. Um, our our working professional life that you know either brought us up or brought us down and what were the choices that we made to contribute to those factors so we're going to try to kind of attack the industry a little bit give some mentorship to the younger generation that's coming up into this industry whether they be guys in the field working with their hands or working on tools or professionals working in office environments designers engineers things like that uh, I, uh, for instance, you know, if you have a, if we have a, uh, a young guy graduating from college with an engineering degree and he has no idea how to go get a job with an engineering firm, if he's got no, no idea how to handle an interview, we want to try to bring some topics up that can hopefully help as he's preparing to graduate and move into the workforce. And there might be some, some ways we can help, uh, some of the, some of the, bring some insight for some of the companies that are struggling to find people to fill these roles, you know, uh, things that they can put on the table to uh, offer to prospective employees that will make their company look a little more um, enticing to uh, professionals that are entering into the workforce or, or looking to better themselves. So we're going to kind of delve into, you know, two directions with this podcast. And one is we're going to be seeking out and we're going to be creating these interviews uh, with these incredibly interesting people that we have in this entire Southeast Texas Golden Triangle area. And then we're going to be trying to do everything we can to explore the industry around us and find out how we can mentor and improve and develop, especially the younger people uh, that are in this industry, and how we can help them better themselves so that we can better their companies, so that we can better each other and better our communities. It all starts with the self. You know, you got to improve yourself before you can do anything else. And Absolutely, yes. You know, I, I know you and I have gone through a lot of that in the past f uh, several years. You know, there's been a lot of work, at really all our lives, as anybody's life should be. It should be a constant self-improvement. And um, so that's kind of the direction we're going in um, with the podcast. We're, we're going to try to bring out a lot of industry-related advice, some industry-related mentorship and motivation. Um, we're going to be documenting Southeast Texas stories. We're going to be documenting interesting and incredible Southeast Texas people and bringing those stories uh, out to as many people as we can. Um, you know, James, why don't we talk a little bit about your background in the industry Um Kind of walk me through uh, your your role right now, what you do, and how did you get started? And kind of uh, you know walk walk us through a little bit of how did you, how did you start from you know a, a a young kid entering the workforce 
right out right after uh, high school and uh kind of getting to the place that you're in now like, what what did that what did that journey look like for you in particular right right so right now I'm James Maxwell I I am a independent consultant in the oil and gas industry primarily focused on the upstream sector of the oil and gas industry which is primarily the the drilling side of the industry since 2006 I've been involved in drilling rigs whether it be building them refurbishment uh, service calls primarily on the electrical side but in the in the last six years I've gotten much more involved with the overall project team and not just being limited just to the electrical side so right now that's what I do I'm an independent consultant I got a, you know my own little LLC company and I have you know a collection of clients that I bounce back and forth from depending on projects and, and what they have is what they need everything from documentation review to doing surveys everything pretty much falls under the the overall topic of consulting but it varies depending on what the client needs are uh, recently we wrote some specifications for a major oil company that needs to build some brand new platform rigs so we help them write some rig spec specifications to get everything down on paper so they can send it out to the bidders uh, before that we were doing some condition surveys for a, a very major oil company they had recently purchased some assets and needed to kind of have some people go out there and and look at the platforms offshore and really kind of do an assessment of certain things so they get an idea of what what all they bought and what the condition is and what our notes are in addition to that we've been doing some surveys as far as doing sound surveys going out to some of these offshore facilities with all their equipment operating and going around throughout the different areas in the facilities and checking and seeing what the sound levels are I mean we'll take an average of probably 1300 to 1600 sound readings in a matter of two or three days throughout these different levels of these these standard production facilities and we'll map out and see and then we'll, we'll take those readings and we'll be able to say okay these are areas where you don't need hearing protection is not required these are areas where you absolutely do need to have hearing protection and then these are also areas where the sound levels are really high and you need to have double hearing protection because it all it's all about safety the offshore and the drilling world whether you're talking about production offshore whether you're talking about drilling it's there is very heavily safety oriented and so it's just one of the things that we do to to work with our clients and to keep their keep their records updated I started in the oil and gas industry back in 2006 um, I was green as the grass I had been working jobs since I was 16 um, worked for one of the local museums in southeast Texas as a landscaper and a uh, security guard helping the helping them out uh, did that through college I worked for a, an, a local ice company um, working for their facility and then I got a call from a friend of mine who was working for an electrical company in Sabine Pass uh, working uh, and they were doing refurbishments on jack up drilling rigs and so he asked me if I wanted a job and I said well so so hold on, hold on. what's a what's a jack up drilling rig for anybody that might be uh might be what what is he talking about <laughs> right there a jack up drilling rig james what what the heck is that so a jack up drilling rig usually has three or four legs it, well what it is is it's a it's an offshore drilling rig but it has no production it usually doesn't have production equipment on it it's just a, a drilling vessel uh but it will actually it will jack the legs up in the air it will suck the legs off the uh off the floor out of the mud and it will float to location and then it will jack the legs down and once those legs go down and hit the uh, hit the ocean floor they'll sink down in the mud in the uh, on the shelf and then it jack as it as those legs hit the ground and get firmly seated then it will it will continue to jack and it will raise the 
the uh, the drilling and living area of the platform. It'll raise that up in the air, you know, to wherever you the, the the required air gap is, you know, 60 feet or 90 feet off the water line, and uh, then they will pr- go ahead and operation. So it's actually s- it's standing on the ocean floor. Okay, so so for the sake of uh, the, our audience. Our wonderful, wonderful audience out there listening in. So that we're talking about a uh, jack up drilling rigs that are that are offshore, right? This is what That's we right. this is what we see off the off the coast of uh, Texas and Louisiana. That's right. That like uh, if you go out to Cameron, Louisiana, or yep. if you go, you can even go out to Sabine Pass or uh, Galveston right now. Maybe you'll see one jacked up in the air. It has the legs sticking up in the air. They kind of have a uh, um, just kind of a uh, uh, what do you call that? The cross structure. Right, so it would uh, it would be and would have a drilling derrick on it, so it'd be the the iconic um the iconic drilling platform that you see sitting off the coastline, uh, what with the what look like the the little towers on them, which are the legs you're talking about. That's so right. for instance, yep. like right now it's it's February the fifth, twenty twenty, and if somebody was to drive down to Galveston, uh, right now and and look at the ship channel. They'd see several of them parked in the uh, shipyard down there at uh, the Gulf Co- the Gulf Copper shipyard, and and that's what we're describing. That's what we're talking about when we say uh, jack up drilling rigs. And I'm pulling you off uh, off topic here, but just to try to make sure we all have a visual on what we're talking about, we're uh, that that we're talking about those guys. So yeah. I I digress. You, all right, we're back to you went to work. Buddy called you in. You went to work on this drilling rig. In the shipyard, electrical contractor. Yeah, so sorry, w- bud. Get back, <laughs> get back on track. My bad. So it was an electrical contractor. So it was an electrical contractor I was hired on with, and I was hired on as an electrical helper. Uh, and I was a helper. I was green as the grass. I had never worked heavy industrial work like that before. Tender foot. Yeah, and I had never done electrical work before. Tender hands. Yeah. So the first day, I got broke in real good. We went up and we pulled cable, pulled big old, I think it was three conductor 373. Big old cable is about probably six or eight inches in diameter. That's high voltage for uh, the layman's. <laughs> yeah, that was that was fun. So we got broke in on that, got filthy, head to toe. And the second day, we did that again. And on the third day, we got a break. Got to learn how to band cable, how to strap it down to the to the trays, and that's when they, the third day on the job is when they they dropped the lower section of a derrick in the shipyard. They dropped the lower <laughs> section of a derrick. Yes, they <laughs> they had a they had an accident on the uh, in the yard, and they dropped the lower section of the derrick right across the uh, drill floor pipe deck, smashed into the top of the living quarters. Didn't hurt anybody. Didn't kill anybody. Just some, just some minor bruises or whatnot. It was, a, it was an absolute miracle. But it's amazing that I, I went back for day four after that, and I've been doing it ever since. Wow. So. Day, day. That was day four. That was day three day when three. all that went day down. Day three. Day three. So day three on the job, and you see essentially a an overhead lifting accident. Absolutely. Okay. Major so, accident. So. Uh, Major accident, major uh, involving cranes, yes. assuming. Okay, so they're involving some cranes and involving some lifting. And um, do they know? Do they know what went wrong in that? Well, there were several things that went wrong. Uh, it was planning, following procedures. There was there was multiple things that went wrong. Um, some of the details I wasn't privy to at the time, and you get multiple stories and such, but. The important thing is, is there was there was some breakdown with procedures, people not following directions and not having the proper JSAs and having everybody on deck uh, and tuned into the job like they were supposed to. It was the lift was actually supposed to happen later in the day, and they they just got too uh, too excited, went out there and tried to be cowboys and try to get it done. And what happened? An accident happened. They were lucky we didn't kill. They didn't kill anybody. Didn't majorly hurt anybody. So that was a blessing, but it, it messed up a lot of equipment. And so uh, there was a lot of stories in the industry of major accidents that have killed people and have hurt people. I mean, uh, 
So it's always good to be mindful of following the procedures. The procedures, the JSAs, um, those things are there for a reason, you know, and sometimes it's a pain in the butt to follow those procedures. Uh, sometimes it seems like it's just too many extra steps, but it's important to work safe. It's important to be safe because in an absolute heartbeat, the whole thing can change. And people that have been around long enough know that once people get complacent and things get quiet and things get too routine, something's going to happen. And you don't want anybody to get too comfortable and hurt somebody else or hurt you. Or Everybody wants to go home to their families go home and sleep in their own bed at the end of the day. So they just got in a hurry and had a little accident. Yeah, they got in a hurry and they had an equipment where they, they actually, I think they, if I remember correctly, I think when they were lifting the section in place, they actually uh, snagged, they didn't lift it up high enough, and it actually snagged part of the foot. One of the feet on the derrick actually snagged part of the drill floor. And when it did, it, it just, it was so much weight as it was, it just uh, caught a cascading effect and broke the boom of the crane and just laid that lower section, just laid that across the uh, across the rig. Wow. So, what, uh, okay, that was day day three. And so, what was, uh, what was it about the job or um, the job environment that, uh, that caused you to come back? I mean... So if you you see something like that, and as you say, you're you're green to the industry, you don't know what to expect, and you see something um, as uh, as major as that happen, and you're in pretty close proximity to it. So, you know, why did you go back on day four? Was it was it the money? Was it the the people? Was it uh, you know, do you do you owe somebody something? Like why why you why you why you want to go back on day four? You know? I was just I was absolutely fascinated with it. You know, I had never, I had never dealt with drilling rigs before in my life. I had never dealt with uh, heavy construction activities in a in a in a in a major sh in a pretty good sized shipyard. Um, I had never dealt with anything in that kind of environment. I just thought it was absolutely fascinating. I just, uh, I really enjoyed the work. I enjoyed the people, but I really enjoyed the work. And, I, and I'm just the kind of person that I like to do things, and I like to do things well. So I just applied myself to learning as much as I could. Um, one of the things that I did is I, I got what they call a tally book in the industry, uh, just a, a booklet that, some of the guys would use for in the past for tallying up when they were doing drilling activities but i would use my tally book for recording everything that i did throughout the day and primarily i mean i was an electrical helper when i started out so th the most that i did was pulling cable the lowest level work on the totem pole pulling cable so i would write down as we were pulling cable and it came past me in the chain I would write down what size cable it was I would write down what the tag number was where did the where did it start where was its final destination did we leave it rolled up in a particular spot halfway for some reason I would write down any pertinent details that I could so not only did I learn you know did I have some kind of some kind of way of identifying what cables we actually messed with by the tag numbers by the identification markings but also so I could learn the different sizes and types of cables that we were handling so I could what do people you know what do you what do you mean when you say 373 what do you mean when you say 1111 what do you mean when you say two pair shielded you know what, what does that mean for somebody that's green I have no idea that's complete Greek to me I have no idea what that means. So as these cables would go by, I would start figuring out how I could look at the cable, how could I identify what it is, and then just get used to what the terminology is and why that all makes sense. And where where the starting and ending point of the cable pool was, that helped me learn the facility, what these different rooms are, why do they call it that, you know, which one's your, your SCR room, which one's your mud pump room. Your sack room, your cement room, you know, all these different rooms, these different allocations, the different sizes of the vessel, you know, learning what all those places were. So it's a pretty important 
lesson already that you know we're probably gonna fall back on that lesson in uh in future future episodes of the importance of documentation especially in our environment the importance of documentation the importance of note keeping um most people um especially once you get up into uh supervisory positions or uh management positions or if you're a like say an equipment manager or a warehouse manager or something like that uh daily journaling um on the job site starts to become a pretty uh, routine habit cuz you start to document what you do throughout the day cuz you can't remember everything for for months and weeks and years so it know, becomes uh, more and more important the higher you are is in getting into managerial roles and or important roles it's it's more and more important to keep a log of what you do what you do throughout the day who you talk to what y'all talk about and have have a a living record of what's going on and also and also having your task list don't rely on your mind to keep track of what your to-do list is keep that stuff logged so you can you can see it you know you don't miss anything strike through it when it's complete and that's more and more important for people in managerial or office roles or engineering roles it's very important but what a lot of people miss it's also very important and very helpful if you're the low man on the totem pole out in the field pulling cable or digging ditches do it anyway do it build that habit it will pay off for you it will set you apart from the others it will show that you're on top of your game that you're presenting yourself professionally even if you're the one pulling the cable and digging the ditches yeah i kind of i remember to go back to that time period um i remember when i came to work in the field uh for the same contractor and uh i remember two of the superintendents and a foreman or two kind of getting into a, a heated conversation one day about what had been done and what hadn't been done yet and we're getting to the end of the project and we're trying to catch up with a you know a full list of tasks and we're trying to remember everything that got finished and i remember one of the superintendents turning and we were all just helpers standing on the sideline kind of watching this argument unfold and i remember one of the superintendents turning to you i remember him saying you know well ask james you know He's got it written down somewhere, and, you know, you pulled your, your notebook out, and sure enough, you know, you had it written down. You said, yeah, you know, we those cable, those that, that cable or those cables, whatever the case was, that was installed, you know, three weeks ago. You know, we, we, we pulled it in on a Tuesday, and, you know, it's it's already been terminated or it's still waiting to be terminated. I don't remember all the details, but I remember you had all the notes on it and the superintendent was like, well, I know he's got it. So, you know, it's those, that's the kind of thing that gets you recognized in the workforce when you're coming up. And and those are the kinds of stories that we're going to start really digging into later on of, and we're going to start singling those stories out. And, um, for anybody that's listening in to these episodes, um, start filtering through as we're posting these and we'll title them out of um you know what the lesson is that we're trying to get across and um those are the kinds of stories we're going to really dig into from a mentoring standpoint from an industry related standpoint of those little things that you can do that'll separate you from the crowd um especially when you're when you're green to an industry you're just starting out how critical it is to stand out how critical it is to be professional and on a daily basis especially if you're the low man and uh you know that's what's going to that's what's going to keep you around so you know kind of kind of bring us from that point to uh you know farther on in your career did you is this something you went to school for is this something that you had to learn on your own how did you develop the knowledge um the theoretical knowledge that's allowed you to succeed in this industry it's just been a lot of on the job training i spent uh i spent several years working in the field i spent uh about a year year and a half working as a helper and broke out into being a, a C class helper, B class helper, A class helper, can I work my way up to getting more and more responsibility and learning more and more skills in the industry? Broke out into being an electrician and was assigned 
individual systems to be my system to install, whether it's a communication system or an alarm system. It was my system to take the engineered drawings, take the components, walk through and make sure everything got put where it was supposed to be put, make sure all the cables were installed properly, wiring everything up correctly, doing all the testing and the commissioning, and handing it over to the, the final the client team for their final verification. So as I broke out from being a helper and electrician, getting more and more responsibility, learning the systems and the installation from the, the, the point that you put the bracket on the wall and you start pulling the cable in to the point that you power everything up and do your final testing and turn it over. And then I broke out. I, I actually changed companies, moved to another company, got a better offer, and broke out into what was a field service engineer type role, basically learning the engineering aspect of it. And for the next several years, I was primarily that, you know, between a, uh, a project engineer and a, and a construction manager, depending on the project. I did service calls. I did fiber optic work, you know, whatever the company needed. We were a small company at the time, so most of us wore multiple hats and filled in wherever we needed to. There were certain jobs that I was basically the foreman or the superintendent on site or the manager of the work and also helping with the engineering and there's other jobs where I was primarily just helping with engineering in the office. Just kind of worked my way along that process and it was pretty much rolling from one project to another, one location to another. We had projects from Pensacola, Florida, all along the Gulf Coast back over to Brownsville, Texas, down there by the border. So we stayed pretty hopping. Uh, we had had several projects and service calls to Mexico. We had done several projects where we had sent, we had done, we had performed uh, refurbishments or upgrades here in the U.S., either in Sabine Pass or Galveston, for rigs that were preparing to go to Mexico. And there was equipment and systems that needed to be installed, upgraded, or modified to meet the contract requirements for PMX in Mexico. So we would make those modifications in the yard, send the rigs down to Mexico, and after they got down there was a few times that I had to go down there and perform some service work or, or help them out if they had some kind of a failure. They didn't know what the problem was. We'd go down there and try to figure it out. We were, by the grace of God, we were successful every single time. We've been through some, we could get down to some specific stories at a later point in time, but we've uh, had some pretty hairy situations, but we came out shining every time, so. Knock on wood, thank the Lord. As is usually the case. That's right. In so, the construction environment. Yeah. So uh, at one point later on, yeah, it was I guess this was about, uh, so we, we've gone from 2006 to 2012. And uh, I was working as a project engineer. We were farmed out to uh, another company that had a project, and we were part of their project team. And then uh, for a variety of reasons, the company we were officially working for, the company we were employees of, uh, pretty much ceased operations. They uh, pretty much collapsed. So Went under. They went under. It's that simple. So we actually went as, that's when we started as actual consultants. Uh, we were consulting to this company, they didn't want to lose us off the projects. They said, well, regardless of the fact of this company you were working for, they've gone down, we'll, we'll pick you up and keep paying you. Same amount you were making, we want to keep you. So we just, that's when we started doing consulting. And we finished that project. Took uh, I took a team to KOS, uh, Keywit Offshore Services in, in Ingleside, Texas, right outside Corpus Christi. Took a team out there, worked there for several months. They allowed us to take a team offshore, so we took some guys offshore and continued working the project offshore for a while, and then uh, I received another offer, and I came back to the Houston area and spent the next several years working in Baytown. We built some brand new rigs for Mexico, took one of them down, rigged it up, uh, platform rigs in Mexico. So those rigs were a little bit different than the jackups on these Platforms, these platforms are uh, structures that are installed as a, a fixed 
platform. And once they put it there, until they get to the point that they decommission it in 10, 20, 30 years, uh, it's firmly stuck there. And it's firmly installed. And then they'll have it tied into the the wells, the, the drilled wells, and they'll have production equipment that will actually produce and they will actually send that product back in the pipelines to go back to the refineries. And so on some of these platforms, they'll actually have uh, modular platform rigs that can actually be assembled in pieces, kind of like a lot of them are box on box. It's kind of some of the phrasing that you hear in, here in the industry. It's just kind of like stacking up Lego pieces and building your, building your rig. And it may be there for a couple of years, three, four, five years, and then they'll take it, take it back apart, and take it to the next platform, and rig it up. So we did that, sent that, uh, sent those rigs down there, and uh, we've been doing some some various other projects and various other clients since then. Got it. So, kind of recapping there, summarize everything. So, went from. We took a trip around the Gulf from Green Helper in Sabine Pass, Texas to uh, becoming a competent electrician, field, in, field installer, field electrician, and uh, working with uh, uh, different uh, electrical contractors all focused in the offshore industry down to uh, learning the field engineering side and the project management side and project control side of the offshore uh, industrial construction and uh, specifically in the oil and gas drilling and production environment and um, finally on to uh, owning operating and owning your own consulting firm and uh and supporting our clients, we have we have several clients that we work with very closely. A lot of our work these days is is just primarily project consulting, and that's supporting them and their clients as far as regulatory guidance, project management guidance, specifications guidance, performing surveys, performing audits, writing procedures writing specifications using our industry experience between me and other team members uh, we probably have I mean within three or four of us we probably got about 70 80 years worth of industry experience that we're bringing to bear for our clients and helping them be successful right now we're we're analyzing project proposals for some new some brand new rigs that need to be built and we're we have r updated the specifications and we are analyzing the, p the contractor proposals as they come in to see how well they comply with the specifications what the holes are what the vulnerabilities are and you know what our thoughts are as far as the quality that they have proposed and see what the bone so we're providing it a higher level service to our clients. Now, I don't get out there and, 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 you know, use my screwdriver as much as I used to. I hardly ever break not, out the screwdriver. Not your tools. You're not on your tools no uh, more. I still got my toolbox in the back of the truck, but uh, I don't grab it much ain't, anymore. Ain't turning wrenches? No, not turning wrenches too much, but uh, using, using the old brain pan. So you're, and I just for the sake of, uh, of, uh, the audience listening in. So, how old? How old are you? If you don't mind me saying, besides being old, how how old are you? I think I'm 36. But 36. I think that's what Mama said last so time I had a birthday. Uh, I've lost Mama count. Says. So, so 36. So you've accomplished all of this. You've gone. You've gone this far in, at, at 36. And uh, yeah, and when do you when do you think you got started? When was the first? When was that day one? When was what? What was day one on the rig? What What do you think that was? How old were you? I, th I think I was 22, 22 or 23. So definitely, definitely 10 years, at least. So definitely at least 10 years. Yeah, in, it's been in the a, industry. It's been about uh, 
and and for you, 13, for yeah. you, it's been pretty much solid it's in the industry. Like you haven't, you really haven't done anything else since you got started. You've been on or near a rig ever since. Pretty much. I mean, so I I did get some exposure in the last couple of years, just some some more uh, some more land based industrial type work and some commercial work with a client I was working for at you know doing some spot work for. So I have gotten a little bit of different exposure from electrical aspect, uh, from a project management perspective. I was helping them out with some management of some projects just because the oil industry was slow. But pretty much everything's been drilling. Pretty, pretty much and pretty offshore. Much, uh, pretty much marine, maritime, yes. pretty yep. much maritime construction. That's right. For the last, at least the last 10 years. Absolutely. A decade. Golly, a decade in time the flies in the, in the when you're having fun. Decade in the maritime environment. So, and I mean, heck, you know, at the uh, at the, the level you've made it to with your own personal business, I mean, that's that's a testament to what can be said when you focus on something, when you focus on one thing, as as opposed to what I did. Uh, to kind of go into my background a little bit, definitely, um, I didn't focus like that. <laughs> so. So, uh, so, so my background. So you you went to work in the in the shipyard, two thousand and six. So I was just graduating high school in two thousand five, and in two thousand six, I went traveling for a summer uh, on the east coast. And uh, when I came back to town, I think you went to work. Well, you went to work uh, spring, right? Spring, yeah, it was like January, sp- January. Yeah, January. So. So winter time, springtime, 2006. I didn't come on board until fall, um, like October ish of 2006. And you know, I went to work doing that because I was flat broke, and uh, I'd been goofing off on the East Coast, traveling around. And by the time I came home, I was flat broke, and I needed a job. And you guys were hiring bodies. That's right. Yep. And we needed cable and pullers. And, and hell, that was all I was, man. It was just a, a laborer, a body. And um but, you know, for for uh I was 19 at the time. So for a 19-year-old kid, the money was pretty good cuz the hours were good. We made a lot of overtime when we were working down there. And um you know, for a for a 19-year-old kid with a high school education, you know, you go to work and and make some money and make plenty of hours and make plenty of overtime, you know, it it's kind of makes it all worthwhile. We didn't we didn't mind working. We knew how no. to work and uh I think that was something that really helped us out cuz we were we were brought up to work and uh and that's that's all the construction industry is really when you boil it down it's nothing but work. If you can work, you can make it. None of it's really that complicated. And Yeah, uh, wasn't it? It was Tommy that pulled us aside one day and we were working like on a Saturday or a Sunday. There wasn't a whole lot of us there. Pulled us aside and told us how much he appreciated us. You know, I appreciate y'all guys coming out. appreciate you doing a good job. And it was like, well, you know, uh, we thank you, Tommy. We we appreciate you saying that, but you paying us to be here and you paying us to work. We're, we're going to work. We're just doing our job. That's right. Yeah, I remember that. And uh, so so I so I I joined I joined the team. And uh, went to work in the shipyard too. Got my start, cut my teeth in the on the on the rig, and um, then I bailed out. So I only did that for a few months. I, I mean, I just did that from like October to to May, and then I bailed out and I went traveling again uh, to New Mexico for the summer, and uh, goofed off in the mountains. Came back uh, once again broke and looking for a job and uh <laughs> the old construction industry is always needing bodies so i went back to work again with y'all in the that fall and um that 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 time i kind of i was a little more committed to it i was like you know what i'm just gonna work i'm just gonna make money and and uh start building uh building my my career and uh then um we ended up getting. I ended up getting laid off well, pretty that much following spring. Yeah. Pretty much the whole crew. We we worked really hard all winter, and then pretty much in the spring we got laid off, and so I went back out to traveling and uh, went back to the mountains and because uh, they were calling, I had to go, and um, goofed off all summer again. And that's when we really. I think that's. I think that's kind of the turning point where we really started to kick off was 
after that summer in two that would have been 2008 uh, th- at the end of that summer, going into that fall, is when you know we got on with a company that uh, we we really put in some work over the next couple of years with that company. That's when we re- I think that is when we really learned and we really cut our teeth. Um, that all started, and we'll probably have to have a whole episode just on that one trip. But that started with a with a an overseas trip. We we uh, flew over to South Africa to jump on a rig, and we rode a rig across the uh, Atlantic um, from Cape Town, South Africa, to Galveston Bay, Texas. Uh, two months at sea. That was a hell of a deal, and we made a, we made a little bit of money. Yeah, we made a little bit of which money. Which made it nice. Um, we got cabin fever, which wasn't fun. You know, it was kind of a, it was a trip. It was a long, boring trip, but we had some good, had some good fun, did some good work, met some good people. Um, got a lot of interesting stories off of that trip. Well, like I said, that'll be a whole episode in, in and of itself. Everybody will have to tune into it. But the, um, then we spent a, we spent a couple of years working the Gulf Coast from Galveston, like you said earlier, from Galveston to Pensacola, um, in your case, all the way down to Brownsville. Um, and then in my case, uh, we had a turning point in the industry in, uh, summer, summer of 2010, we hit a turning point when, uh, we had the, uh, explosion on the, uh, deep water horizon in the Gulf of, uh, Gulf of Mexico, uh, which was operated un- under lease to, um, British Petroleum or BP. And uh, most people remember that incident, but we happened uh, to be working a job for our company just a few miles away from that rig. And um, that incident shut our industry down for months. You know, it really, it really, and of course the explosion itself and then uh, other situations in the industry like the moratorium on drilling and things like that that really pinched our industry down for several months. And um, that was kind of a turning point in in my career because it it shut the job I was working on it shut shut it down. I was I was offshore. I had a job going offshore at the time. We had been sent home. We weren't on the water when the explosion happened, but our job was out there, and we couldn't get back to our job. And so that was a turning point when I I actually took advantage of the situation and went back to school and uh, finished a. Um, instrumentation degree at um, the local uh, technical school, uh, uh, LIT, Lamar Institute of Technology. And and then I kind of bounced all around. I kind of did all kinds of different things. Unlike you, you kind of stayed, uh, you stayed in your niche, stayed focused on the uh, mari- maritime construction environment. I kind of bounced all around after I got that associate's degree. I did everything from from uh, work at a work at a, a plastics mill uh, here locally to um, working for a civil engineer to working in a machine shop for a local manufacturing company to um, moving on to where I'm at now uh, doing uh, industrial construction and general construction and general contracting everything from doing light civil work to, to building maintenance and plumbing work and you name it. We kind of do a little bit of it all now. And so whereas you've kind of stayed, you know, really focused and uh, and very, um, a very... Uh, a very limited <laughs> sector. Of but very technical, yeah. Yes, very yes. Lim- Yeah, li- a small, small sector, but very technical um, and very focused. Uh, I've kind of been kind of bouncing all over, all around for... Uh, for the um the last uh decade and um but it's cool we've learned a lot we've seen a lot learned a lot had some good mentors and that's what we're going to be really focusing on trying to trying to move around and expose and 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 share so um as we're kind of working through this man um you know what are what let's let's hit a question here what's um what do you think What's the in your experience with what you've done and in your career so far? What's the worst job? What's the worst for you know? And 
and there's a lot of there's a lot of guys coming up now that I don't think they they know how bad it can be sometimes. <laughs> I don't think I know how bad it can really be. There's a lot of things that I think of that that were tough that uh you know some of the older generation tell me some stories of how they did things. I'm like, man, I don't know how y'all got got through the day doing that. But what do you think? What's one of the toughest things if you if you could you know think back to to one of the hardest days you had on the job you know task wise what do you think was the hardest I mean, task when, when i think about what was the the worst job i had to do you know the the thing that comes to mind for me that just immediately pops into my mind is painting back oh, when the first no. first job i ever had it was you know landscaping and buildings maintenance at a museum, an old historic home museum. And if anybody has knows anything about an old historic home that's a hundred plus years old, it's maintenance all the time. Every day. It's maintenance, maintenance, maintenance. Especially on a large home like that. I mean it's there's always something that needs to, you know, somewhere that you need to be scraping, priming and painting. And I just hate painting but that's just a personal preference but I, I question people that say they like painting i i don't know what it is but i, I just hate it i, I hate it I just and can't stand and uh and, and and anybody that says they enjoy doing that shit i'm like what what <laughs> is wrong what is wrong with you like how how do you like i mean I, I mean when we're talking about like painting buildings and walls and stuff i mean it's just, I just don't understand how that can be enjoyable. Some people have a knack for it, more power to them. I'm happy to hire them any day of the week I just guess. so I don't have to do it. But, I mean, we've I've worked in some, some rough environments, uh, dirty environments, um, worked in environments. So, I mean, you'd be, you know, within 30 minutes, you'd be covered in mud and muck grease. or grime and grease, uh, sweat all the way through your clothes within the first hour of the day and you'd be walking around in soggy clothes all throughout the day uh, worked where we uh, we've done a lot of derrick work flying up in the derrick installing equipment and stuff and for me i've never been comfortable with heights i've never been i've never froze on any of the derricks i've ever been on on any of the no matter how tall they were I've never froze, but I've never been comfortable. But I've done a lot of work in the derricks because that was one of the things I wanted to do was try to to get more comfortable. And uh, and there was a while there where we did a lot of work, you and I, in the yeah. derricks, and we got pretty comfortable with it. Yeah. You yeah. Know? They. Uh, I, I think y'all screwed me on that when uh, I came to work in the uh, – when I first came to work in, in the shipyard – that was one of the first things that, because uh, I'd been out on the East Coast backpacking. I'd been hiking and uh, climbing the hills and climbing the mountains. And I think you told one of the superintendents he's, what I was doing. You, oh, he's out in the woods climbing mountains and backpacking trails. And when I showed up on the job site, you know, I didn't, w we didn't make it very, very long on the job before we had to do a bunch of work in the derrick. And uh, a bunch of jobs got scheduled. Um to go up in the derrick and 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 uh do installations and they asked me they said well you've been on you've been climbing all these mountains and hiking all these trails you say you're not you're not afraid of heights are you i said no nah, i ain't afraid of heights what you talking about and they said oh well you, you can go up in the derrick then and i said well what do we got to do in the derrick and they said just put this harness on and if i would have known you know, I might have kept my mouth shut. You know, I might have said I was really afraid of heights. I couldn't handle heights or something because, you know, once you got on that job, it was like you, you had to do, it was pretty labor intensive. It and you was, had to, and it was, it was and you intensive. were exposed. Everybody could see you. So you could, you were out in the open. So you couldn't, it wasn't like you could goof off. Like you had to work because everybody could see whether you were working or not. And, um, and for anybody that doesn't know, like you're wearing a, so when we were working on the inside of the derrick, we were being winched up and down on the inside of the derrick. So oh we were yeah. we were wearing yeah. a, a riding a, belt, a, a riding belt with like sometimes we either we had a 
Sometimes you had a seated board that you kind of sat on. Sometimes you were just kind of sitting in a harness. But you actually had a, a, a wire rope, a cable that came off a winch, went all the way to the top of the derrick, threw a pulley, and all the way back down on the inside and hooked that winch, that cable on to you. And it was yeah. like, from what I remember, it was like probably like quarter inch cable in or something like that or half inch not well, probably wasn't big, as big as half inch but something like something like that and it was so you know f- for everybody that hasn't witnessed that you know we're talking about a steel cable running through a pulley in the top of the derrick and then we're we're lashing ourselves into that cable with a, a full body harness that has a uh a wooden board built into the harness so that you have something to sit on. And then an operator, an equipment operator, is sitting on the pulley system, the uh, the pneumatically operated, uh, the air-operated winch system, and he's... Um, Winching you up and down pulling the you, Yeah, pulling you up and down the, the derrick yeah. by that seat. And... Um, and you got all your stuff strapped to you. You got all your tools yeah, you strapped to you. you. If you're fifty pounds you're, worth of tools on you. Yeah, if you're hanging lights in the derrick, you got a you got a Lashes. fifty pound light yeah. hanging from you know your the bottom of your harness yep. that you're having to we'd tie tie a, we'd tie a big uh, halogen light onto our harness and then we let the operator hoist us up into the derrick and then you. He'd carry the light up with you and then bolt it up to the bracket wherever it was supposed to be mounted throughout the derrick and and then pull the cable up after you and strap the cable to whatever mountain brackets were in place and then hook the light up and and try not to get hung up on anything while you were floating up and down the uh, down the derrick. Yeah, you know? and you weren't you were not the only one working up there, so you had to watch out. You had for to watch out for everything that was and yeah, yeah, speaking of uh Speaking of safety, I watched a guy, uh, saw a guy drop a 16-pound sledgehammer from about 90 feet up in a derrick one day and watched that thing tumble all the way down to the, the rig floor about 90 feet below where he was working and, and, and just narrowly missed some guys that were on the floor below. And uh, so there's, you know, you really had to, that was that was a, a, a good thing about that environment probably for us is that, you know, we learned how to pay attention we learned to watch what was going on around us, and luckily, you know, we never got hurt. Um, never seriously got hurt. Never, never had anybody seriously get hurt right around us, and uh, so we got lucky, and we got to learn some lessons without having to deal with, you know, major accidents, major the percussions of major accidents. So, um, so that's uh, that was a good thing. So that's well, been some that's been some interesting experiences. Yeah, we've you know as far as a lot of you know I don't know. There's a lot of a lot of things we could talk about related to the safety aspect of construction, um, related to the um, the the dynamics of of working around uh, multiple crafts, uh, overhead work, confined space work. All that kind of stuff. Uh, a lot of a lot of valuable lessons we learned. Uh, luckily, without having to pay for them, and uh, you know, a lot of things we'll be hope hopefully we'll be digging into in the in the future episodes and kind of singling those lessons out and spending some time kind of breaking them apart, delving into them a little bit, and you know, trying to trying to figure out how we can communicate and articulate those lessons out to other people so that they can. Uh, move forward without having to relearn those lessons or learn them for themselves. Take what we've got and take what we've heard from other people. And uh, you know, they say I had a riding coach tell me that uh, you know winners learn from their mistakes, champions learn from other people's mistakes. That's a good point. And the point of a coach, the job, the main job of a coach is to shorten the learning curve. And so I think what we're trying to do here is kind of you know, be a coaching, mentoring environment for people trying to get into this type of work and bring those lessons, whether they're our lessons or somebody else's lessons, bring those lessons to the forefront and say, look, you know, you can you can go out there and stumble around on your own, beat your head against a brick wall, or you can listen, you know, let us 
coach you through some lessons. Let us bring in other people who can coach us all through other lessons that we don't know yet. And we can all benefit and shorten the learning curve by creating those conversations. So um, that's it in a nutshell, I guess. Uh, So what about kind of bounce around a little bit but what do you think who do you see one person we're going to pick one person and we're just going to kind of um for the sake of time who do you see as a most in influential figure in your career who would you if you could pick one person for now just an example of somebody that was super influential in your career in the past, well, who would that be? Somebody personally, somebody you knew, worked for, worked with, worked worked for you, whatever. Somebody influential that, that you knew and dealt with personally. And, and why do you think, um, you don't have to necessarily name them, but, you know, much maybe what they were, uh, what their role was, and uh, and why, why they were so important in your career. I would say when I started working uh, for the first electrical contractor I was working for, the two main superintendents that uh, we worked under, they were the kind of two sides of, of the same coin. They had, they both had their particular roles that they played, but they were both, they both, both worked well with each other, they complemented each other, and they both cared about the project and the clients and delivering a successful project on time, on budget, and safely. Uh, one of the superintendents was, he was much more uh, ad adapt at uh, the bidding process and paperwork and, and keeping things organized and keeping you know some of the office work flowing. And so he, he focused on that aspect of things and he was, he was a little bit more of a, a, of a friendly nature towards the workers and the other superintendent he was he was uh more of a country cowboy kind of guy and he was very knowledgeable had a lot of really valuable experience and he was also he came from a, a very old school lineman's background so he was also kind of a he could be a hard man to work for but he would, I'm, he was a hard man to work for for some people, but people like you and I, as we were working for him, we didn't have any trouble with him for the most part because if he told us to do something, we would go and do it. And if we had a problem or we made a mistake and we fessed up to it and we went and got him and told him what the problem was or what mistake we made and what our plan was to fix it, he was usually pretty good with you know understanding and helping us find the right solution to move forward uh, to me i think they set i mean they were not perfect by any means none of us are uh, they had their faults just like anybody else uh, there were things that they did or said or such that you know could frustrate you being lower on the totem pole and not understanding the bigger picture Everybody has their personality quirks and stuff. But there was a lot of good lessons set. And uh, and they cared about the people that worked under them. They care b cared about keeping everybody safe. And they cared about taking care of the clients and delivering a quality product. And, uh, and there's a lot of lessons that we learned in those first several years working there in Sabine Pass between the South Yard and between Gabby's Yard. And so being passed, there was a lot of valuable lessons that we learned from that environment that have really helped us as the, as we've progressed in our careers and uh, as we've gotten older because we see the importance of uh, the way that they, they ran things and things that we liked, things that we didn't like, and, and getting the different perspective on things as we've gotten older. So as far as the most influential, I say that uh, – those two individuals, those two superintendents that we worked on, worked under, 
there in the south yard and at Gabby's yard in Sabine Pass for that first electrical contractor. I think they uh, they really set a, a good tone. Set the standard, so yes. to speak. Yeah. Okay. Cool. 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 So, you know, man, we've spent an hour. Well, that, that went by quick. I hour, was I was hour. thinking this was I didn't know how this was gonna roll because this is the first time we sat down to try to try well, to do this, but an hour went. That was by an hour, quick. an hour and four minutes. Nope, it's hour and five now. Hour and five minutes. So, yeah, it's an hour and five minutes of uh, um, listening to a couple of kids talk about the oil field and uh, try to give uh, some kind of an introduction into uh, what this is going to be, what this is going to turn into, and uh, we'll just kind of let this thing organically grow as it does and um, see what kind of monster it can be. Um, I think we can uh, we can kill it. Sounds good. We can kill the old episode one right there. All right. And uh, you know what that means. All we got to do now is uh, hit the stop button and uh, go for op- episode two. <laughs> <laughs> so that's it, man. We finished it. We finished. First episode. Numero uno. It's done. Episode one is finished. Golden Triangle Signal. James Maxwell. And Stephen Maxwell. Episode one is done. Absolutely. Golden Triangle Signal. We can get us a website and everything set up. Yeah, we'll be watching out for that. Details. That's right. Thanks for tuning in. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. The first one's done.